Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Silicon video, we're going to be delving into the second part of the Zen Technical Analysis, thanks to the information revealed by AMD at the Hot Chips 28 conference. There will be a third part coming in a day or two, and while this video was originally intended to be a single part, it ended up being about an hour in length, and it simply would have been a nightmare to edit it all in one shot, and after asking you all on Facebook and Twitter, it seemed the majority of you wanted me to separate it into two parts, I guess also for the sake of... Um, you know, digestibility. With all of that said, the entire article is available to read, which is linked in the video description. It's all one single page. So if you want all of the information now, well, you can go ahead and check that out. Also, I'm going to be assuming you're watching this video or reading the article after you have watched the first or read the first part. If you have not done so, I would suggest you do that. It's linked in the video description um, and I do want to make this video as open as possible to as many people as possible rather than just focus on a lot of technical jargon. That's just so that I can educate people, well I, I don't like to use the word educate, but just appeal to as many people as possible so that as many folks as possible are, well, you know, knowledgeable on what's going on rather than just appealing to a few select people. I don't know how that came across, but, you know, I've, I've rolled with it now. It's fine. So, um, with all of that said, let's start. So, I do want to give a very brief history on where we're at. AMD have already shown one benchmark of Zen, and during this benchmark, it showed that the processor is about as fast as an i7 6900K, I say about because it's about two seconds faster, but you know, for all intents and purposes, that wasn't really the purpose of the benchmark. It wasn't to show that, hey, we're faster. It was to more show that, yeah, we're very competitive. There have been a few other benchmarks leaked, but ultimately they are on uh, things such as Ashes of the Singularity, and we don't know all of the test settings, and we don't know the rest of the system. And so, you know, how much stock you want to put into those is totally down to you. So fast forward to the modern day, AMD are still being very aggressive with the various claims of, it, of the Zen architecture. I don't want to read out all of the performance and power improvements for Zen because quite frankly I'll be going through all of them in this video anyway. But generally speaking, we're looking at the two threads per core, uh, branch misprediction improvements, um, we're looking at better op cache, um, we're looking at quad issue FPUs, um, better caching system including much higher bandwidth, um, we're looking at a faster uh, or rather lower latency cache, um, and the fact that the cache on the level 3 can actually be accessed via different cores, and also low power, various uh, aggressive clock gating, uh, and right back level one cache and a few other bits and pieces. Now the level one, sorry, the low power stuff we generally tackled in part one. So if you're very interested in that, you should check out part one if you've not already done so. But AMD did dedicate the first couple of slides to the IPC improvements and power consumption improvements. Basically, all you can think of this is the architecture improvements they generally made. For example, once again, the right back cache. Um, the larger op cache and other bits and bobs combined with the fact that it's on a 14 nm finfet process and theoretically and once again everything's in theory because just because amd tell us it just because amd are demonstrating on stage i'll assume they're telling the truth but i'm not going to 100 percent guarantee it's telling the truth until i'm testing it or until until it's op out in the open so you know Remain optimistic, but do have that little bit of healthy skepticism as well. That's that's how I personally deal with things. But regardless, AMD are promising us we're getting going to see a high a higher uh, IPC about forty percent over the excavator technology, and naturally we're also going to see improvements in efficiency, which basically means we're going to be hoovering less energy up to accomplish the same tasks based uh, on the previous architecture. So, theoretically speaking, it should scale rather nicely on um, high-performance computing, the desktop, laptops, and other designs as well. Okay, so now we've basically covered the stuff that we had really in-depth covered in the previous part. What about this new information? All right, 
So although this is a slide for much later on in the deck, I really wanted to cover this first, or at least get it out, out, out into the open, because I feel that it's, it's pertinent enough that if we understand this, we can understand the rest of the processor in a much better manner. So most graphics cards now are built in a modular fashion. Basically speaking, this means you can have a different number of compute units or CUDA cores and those will essentially be um, different models. So for example, if you have a GTX 1070, it will have 1920 uh, CUDA cores enabled, whereas if you have a GTX 1080, it will have 2560 CUDA cores enabled. However, they are still using the same GP104 core. Now, although this is not exactly the same case for the Zen, the basic idea remains fundamentally the same. And if you've got some real in-depth knowledge of the, let's say, the Jaguars and the architecture inside the PS4 or Xbox One, you're going to have a basic understanding on how these modules were connected. So, what is a CPU complex, also known as a CCX? I'm going to go between CCX and CPU complex. They are... CCX is just simply the acronym, just to clarify. So a CCX is four Zen processor cores. So just to clarify, there are four Zen cores inside one CPU complex. Each of those cores can handle two threads each because they are simultaneous multi-threading capable. We'll get to that, don't worry. And this allows AMD to tweak the processor in a number of ways. So for example, they can simply add two CCXs together and that will give them eight cores or they could disable two of the cores in a CCX and that would give them either two cores or six cores depending on once again if they're adding those together. And that's going to be really interesting because if you have two CCXs together which is eight processor cores, 16 threads, that is as high a configuration as we're going to be looking for on the desktop, supposedly. I also want to touch on level 3 cache because we're going to be discussing it a lot in this video. But level 3 cache is 16 way associative. I'm going to assume you know what that means because we covered what that was in the previous part of the video. If not, you can either check the article or you can Google it. It's totally up to you, but it's going to take a lot of video for me to re explain that. Um, and it's 16 way associative. It's 8 megabytes and mostly exclusive of level 2. What does that mean? Well, there's 8 megabytes of cache on one CPU complex. So in short, 4 cores are sharing 8 megabytes. That means 2 megabytes each. But each core can access the other core's share of level 3. So let's say for the sake of argument, core 0 can access core 1's cache. It's mostly exclusive. That means that level 2 or rather data that's held in level 2 should generally, in theory, not be mirrored in level 3. So level 3, um, we will go into the differences between it and level 2, but it's very important to know this because you're going to get a better understanding of the processor as we're going through. AMD have revealed an updated slide of the Zen micro architecture. Now it's imperative to remember that this slide which goes into the architecture is based upon a single core. So for example where it says fetch 48x86 instructions it is for a single processor core and we'll start going into what all of this means. So AMD have separated the integer and floating pipelines. We'll go more into that, what that means in a moment. The four integer pipelines are coupled with 160 entry register file. We'll get to that. While the floating point contains 160 entry register file, and we'll get to that as well. Now, AMD have touted a whole bunch of features, but the most obvious one they're really pushing are the improvements to the cache, the changes to the integer units, and the two threads per core. Now we're going to be talking about the various stages of the grabbing of instructions, processing the instructions, and then using those instructions uh, in this particular part known as instruction pipelining. Now it's kind of outside the remit to, of this video to go really in depth into this, however I will be explaining a brief synopsis of each step assuming that you're not familiar with it.
So really, fetch is the first, first stage in the basic CISC, that would be complex instruction set computing, which for the sake of this video, just think of as an x86 CPU, in other words, Zen or most Intel CPUs, pipeline. It's basically the CPU grabbing a relevant piece of data from whichever location it's being stored in or contained in. So for example, that would be from system RAM or maybe another cache or what have you. Now, AMD have really been aggressive when it comes to when it comes to AMD's prediction. So basically what they've done is decouple the branch prediction from the Zen uh, cores. Branch prediction is simply the technique that the CPU uses to guess which way the program is going to be going um, as it goes through the structure. So for example, it can be traditional if then and else structure. Now what this basically means is that if you have a program, generally there will be conditional statements. And I'm going to make a really simplified example. Let's say that you are um, playing a game and you have a very simple um, direction. You have either go left or go right. So if you go left, it's if, but if you go right, it would be else. And it's vastly simplified, but if you're slightly familiar with programming, you know what I mean. But as I said, I'm trying to keep this video fairly, uh, fairly friendly. So because of the decoupled nature, the fetch has greater freedom to run ahead of the other components of the processor. Now, we're not sure exactly how it uses these algorithms, but there are internal algorithms algorithms, excuse me, in place, which will help um, predict what data it needs first. Now, the reason this is so important is because the purpose of fetch is to grab instructions before the processor needs to execute those instructions. We'll get to that in a second. So, in, once again, theory, this will reduce the latency of the CPU, reduce pipeline stalls, very important in SMT configurations. But the problem is that if the guess is wrong, so let's say it guesses if, but you choose then, just for example, then extra energy is used up in the process because it has to do another fetch request, basically. AMD were not so happy to give us information of the BTB, which is branch target predict branch target buffer, excuse me, for Zen. All they've said is large, which is not really that good of a point of comparison, because large compared to what? Is it large compared to the previous architecture? And if so, is it bigger? Is it the same size? We don't know. Bulldozer has a 512 entry four-way level one, which is the single cycle of latency. I'm having one of those days. Um, but we're just going to have to wait and see what happens with that. So the other key component to fetch would be the translation look aside buffer. This is known as TLB. Its job is to reduce latency by keeping tabs on the virtual memory and translate virtual memory addresses to a real physical address. Now I really don't want to go into the ins and outs of virtual memory, but know that basically as programs get bigger, certain parts of them will be squeezed to out of system RAM to slower secondary storage. So basically what this does is it's like, okay, well, this is for that. AMD lists Zen's TLB as level 0 with 8 entries per page size, level 1 with 64 entries, and level 2 with 512. But the level 2 supports only 4K and 256K page sizes. By the way, if you're unfamiliar with what an entry is, you can literally think of it as a piece of data, as an entry, as a, as a bit of data that's just held in that, um, well, buffer or piece of memory, if you prefer. So, if you're still unfamiliar with what any of this means, it basically means that Zen will be much more efficient at fetching instructions from the computer's memory. Theoretically, it will use less power while doing so, and generally the purpose behind all of this is lower power consumption but also to keep the pipeline as busy as possible. It doesn't matter how fast you're actually executing instructions in theory. Um, if you're if you need an example, imagine that you have a I don't know a garden hose just for the sake of argument that's like 15 inches wide at the very very end, 
you know, where it's actually spurting out the water, but where it actually connects to the faucet, where it connects to your tap, it's like a quarter of an inch and you've turned it on just to a tiny trickle. Does it really matter how wide the end is? No, because it can't execute enough water um, based upon the fact that the blockage is way, way in the back. So you can think of it exactly like this. It's a bit like memory bandwidth on a traditional GPU. It's like if you've got, let's say, a Fury X, but you somehow managed to solder instead like a stick of DDR1 memory to it, you're going to run into many other problems other than the GPU itself not being able to process the data. Anywho, this means that theoretically we're going to have fewer uh, thread stalls and the program theoretically should be able to have fewer bubbles in those pipelines. Bubbles are basically where this, the pipeline itself is doing diddly shit. It's just pretty much doing nothing. Now next up we need to talk about the decoder. If you're not familiar with what decoding is, it's to receive an instruction which we've already discussed in the fetch stage and then the decoder itself takes that instruction and then it translates it to an to a language that the processor itself can understand we'll get more into ISA's instruction sets later on but now all you need to know is that it will take a instruction and say, okay, I'm going to make it readily available for the execution units, which we'll get to in a moment, to actually understand how to execute that. So, for example, it could be that it's grabbing a piece of data, and that piece of data, the decoder looks at and says, oh, okay, this is a piece of data that's telling the processor, I need you to add these two numbers together. So it could be, you need to add one to the number two. It's basically like that. So AMD's Zen Core, a single Zen Core, I just want to reiterate that, can handle decoding four x86 instructions per cycle. Now these can be fused together so that a micro operation, these by the way are low level instructions, can go through the micro op queue, but they still represent technically two instructions. Zen also possesses a stack engine, which is a new feature that AMD have added to Zen. Its function is to basically reduce the power consumption of the processor. Essentially what it does is it takes place between the queue and the dispatch. So it uses already known memory addresses, so let's assume that the processor has just very recently accessed a piece of data in a certain memory address because that's what happens. Data is given and assigned a memory address. So for example it could be you know, one plus one is held in the memory storage location of FF0, just for the sake of argument. And so if it needs to remember one plus one again, all it needs to do is say, oh, hey, all I have to do is look in FF0 and I've got that piece of data, which is very good if you're, let's say, doing complex sums and algorithms, and then you don't need to recalculate that. All you have to do is look at the result. So what it does is it will use... Um, the uh, stack engine will remember what the hell it's what the hell it's um, recently accessed and save the CPU for going have to go through that entire step all over again, and then it will dispatch from the decoder. Now it will send instructions at either six per cycle to the integer pipeline scheduler, or four per cycle to the floating point scheduler. Zen allows the dispatch unit to send off an instruction to both the integer and floating point at the same time and as you can imagine this increases the throughput of the processor because that would mean that otherwise the CPU would need to do it on a alternate cycle basis so for example on cycle one it would be like okay I'm dispatching this to the floating point unit on cycle two I'm going to dispatch this instruction to the integer unit and strike cycle three I'm going to dispatch it to the floating point unit and so on and so on and so on so um, now I think we've got a fundamental understanding of the first two parts of the pipeline let's now focus on execute so the next stage of the pipeline would be execute. This is where commands, which you can think of as instructions, are actually carried out. And then they're stored, the results that would be, in a register. To put it another way, it's the part of the CPU which takes the data and calculates the results of the equation it was sent. For example, 1 plus 1, it would write that result into a register. Now for Zen, micro-operations, which, which we've just discussed, 
are now sent to one of two possible routes. Now, one would be the integer, and two would be the floating point unit. Now, remember, both of these units are still contained within a single Zen core. So, integers, just so we're all clear, are whole numbers. So, for example, one, two, 1024. These are integers, while floating points would be like 6.345 or something like that. Now, I guess it makes sense to start with integers first. So, let's begin. As I did hint at earlier, there's a 160 entry register. By the way, a register, just to clarify, is a very fast uh, storage location. So in this respect, the int, can, the integer um, unit can store 168 things in this location. And it sends this data into one of four ALUs, arithmetic logic units, which are the things that actually do the calculation, and then two address generation units. Now this allows a single Zen core to set schedule six micro operations per cycle. An execution port has its own 14 entry scheduler queue. The entry unit can handle two branches per cycle, which is highlighted on the slide, but from what I can tell based upon interviews, there are a few limitations to this. Basically, not all of the four ALUs are equal in function. So, a two of these are capable of branches, while one can perform signed multiply, while the f final, fourth ALU, handles CRC, which is Cilic Cycle Redundancy Check. From what AMD have mentioned, though, the ALUs are symmetric, but they do have some specialized operations, which I've just mentioned, but how exactly all of this works under wraps, we're not quite sure yet, so the company are being pretty tight-lipped, unfortunately. However, there is a major improvement over the older excavator architecture. Zen integer pipelines also keep tab on the multiple instructions as they branch out. This serves as two purposes. The first is it can nuke any data which happens to be the same result. So this basically saves storage space on the processor and what and uses also know what's known as move elimination this simply uses the mov or move command if it needs to move the data from one register location to another register location so for example if it needs to move from register 1 to register 4 you can think of this in many ways as just doing a find and replace in a word document if you've used one word and then decided to use another for example you spell someone's name incorrectly and you need to make an amendment and through the entire document you would simply find and replace so in this respect the cpu the processor now knows that the data that was once held in register one is now held in register four now the other option for this would be to send this data all the way all the way around the processor once again but doing this obviously is going to be a lot slower uses more energy uses more cycles this is basically a simpler cheaper way in terms of performance of doing exactly the same goal so what about the floating point unit which once again is dealing with like non-whole numbers so 4.323 or something like that well, the floating part, part part of the core holds a 160 entry register file, which we've just discussed what a register uh, entry is. And as you can see from the diagram, the floating point can be actually sent off to the integer if required by a particular set of operations. AMD have added a fourth pipeline for the FP unit, which was new over the excavator architecture, but they're not saying much about the latency, unfortunately. All I've said is it's going to be faster than the previous CPUs. Now what we can tell from these diagrams, however, is that the integer and floating point units both have access to the retirement queue directly. Just because an instruction has been executed, just to clarify, it doesn't mean that the result has been written back to RAM. What it does is it instead stores this in a retirement queue, which then the CPU will write back to RAM once the retirement queue is well ready. Now, it's quite important because while you don't want to starve the execution units of data, you also don't want the reverse. You don't want the execution units to be running so far ahead of the data write back that it's basically being stalled. After all, if you can't store any more results, the execution units are simply 
unable to do anything. They're just like, la 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 la, waiting, waiting, waiting. And then once the right back is uh, finished, then obviously um, you've got the retirement queue which is flushed, which means it's emptied, and then the execution units can continue. And I was very impressed I managed to get that out considering an eyelash was attacking me. Theoretically speaking, AMD are being a lot more aggressive when it comes to this, and they basically are hoping, once again, to reduce the latency across the entire processor. Now, as you can see in the slide, it's 192 entry wide and retires up to 8 instruction per CPU cycle, which, once again, in theory, and you've got to love that, should keep up with the single processor core, because remember, theoretically, it can handle up to two threads, and given from what we know about send instructions rather to both the floating point and integer units simultaneously this is going to be very very important for the processor indeed